Hey guys, it's Miss Levy again, and here we are at part three of our web series about the models review. And so in part two, we left off here at Wallerstein's World Systems Theory, the core periphery model. So sometimes you'll see this model referred to again as World Systems Theory, sometimes as core periphery model. They are the same thing. And keeping in mind, again, the point of it um, is to explain world political, social, economic, and military dominance and categorizes countries of the world into three different um, levels. You have the core countries, which in reality, when you look at Rostow's model, the core countries are the MDCs. The semi-periphery, which in Rostow's model are the DCs, or the newly industrialized countries, and the periphery countries, which in Rostow's model are the LDCs. So again, in the periphery, we left off that the countries, these are the countries that have the lowest levels of economic productivity. They have low per capita incomes, generally low standards of living. They are the world's economic periphery. They provide the world with very cheap labor and cheap materials. So they are the suppliers of that. And this includes areas in Sub-Saharan Africa, parts of Latin America, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. So again, these would be very similar to the LDCs of the world. And there are a few events in history that have led to the creation of this particular relationship. And we've talked about these on numerous occasions. And some of the most significant um, are first the agriculture revolution, which was thousands of years ago. This was the invention of agriculture. This allowed people to settle, settle in permanent locations because now they could feed themselves. Then fast forward, um, we have colonization, the European colonization, which was in the 1400s and then continued into really the um, early 1900s. And this was the Europeans colonizing, so taking territory um, in order to use it to exploit for resources and for market purposes. And so this gave the Europeans a great advantage. And those countries that had been colonized, like Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, and parts of Latin America, really until after World War II, so only gained independence since the 1950s, they were at a great disadvantage whenever you look at development. There's this saying that he who starts first tends to finish ahead. It's the same thing, and colonization allowed a lot of those European countries to start first. Then, um, moving forward, we had the um, industrial revolution which was in the late 1700s into the beginning of the 1900s again began in England and then diffused through Europe and over to Canada the United States and to Australia this gave those countries the advantage of beginning industrialization much faster and so they gained wealth much quicker and so all of these led to what ultimately leads to this dynamic of core, semi-periphery, and periphery. So here we have our core periphery model. You can see that the orange represents the core. You have Anglo-America. Then over we have um, Western Europe. Then we have Australia. And then of course we have Japan and South Korea. Then we have our semi-periphery. You can see that'd be Russia, Eastern Europe, China, India. Um, this is Saudi Arabia and the other oil producing countries, South Africa, and then we obviously have Brazil, um, Chile, um, and Mexico, and then we have our periphery countries, which often this will coincide with our LDC, DC, MDC um, match. Okay, next let's talk about urban models. So our first in the urban model section, we have the concentric zone model. Um, as we know, the concentric zone model looks very similar to the von Thunen agricultural model in structure. So this model was created by Burgess, and the purpose, like most of the urban models, is to explain the settlement patterns of people in cities and how they decide where to live. So the settlement patterns of people in cities and how they decide where to live. And this uh, definition is that the city grows outward from the CBD in a series of concentric rings. The rings denote different classes of people. So let's take a look at these various classes of people. 
So we have at the very center of our model, just like we do in every single one of our models, is the CBD, the Central Business District. This is the center of our business activity. Then in the second model, immediately surrounding our CBD, we have our zone of transition. This contains industry in the poor houses and um, factories, so low income factories and our industry. Then in our third model, as we move, or as our third ring, as we move outside away from the CBD, we have our zone of independent houses. These are our working class zone. Um, these people, um, they, this zone contains modest homes with working class families. Then in the fourth ring, as we move out, we have our zone of better residences. These are um, wealthier middle class people with newer spacious homes. And then all the way out here on the outside is our commuter zone. In our commuter zone, these people have much bigger uh, land areas, much bigger homes. They've escaped the built up areas of the um, central city, the CBD. They will commute into uh, the city for work every day. Keeping in mind the centric concentric zone model was modeled after Chicago, just like the other models will. So you can see that the reason being that they chose Chicago in the 1920s for a concentric zone was there's no barrier to expansion which with the exception of Lake Michigan to the east. So flat land on the prairie. Next we have our sector model. Sector model is the concentric zone, um, but as the uh, city grew and changed and wealth and income and whatnot, um, the makeup of the city changed, then it spread from the concentric rings to our sectors, our wedges. So this is Hoyt's model. The purpose is to explain the settlement patterns of people so Hoyt uh, sector model, again, just like the concentric zone. Um, and like we said, the, the sector model is the concentric zone. But as the city grew and changed and wealth changed in the makeup, socioeconomic and um, the income class of the city changed, the concentric, the rings gave way to wedges, to sectors. And so this also explains the settlement patterns of people in cities and how they decide where to look, where to live. The city develops in a ring, in a, excuse me, the city develops in a series of sectors, not rings. And so as a city grows, ex activities expand outward in a wedge from the CBD. Many areas are more attractive for various activities. Social classes are found in sectors of a city, not in the rings from the inside out. So let's take a look here at our model. At the center of the model, just like in all the other models, we have our CBD. For the first time, we have a transportation corridor and this model demonstrates the importance of the transportation um, network. This is also Chicago um, as Chicago grew and changed. And so that is why around most cities you see this transportation network skirting the downtown. Same with downtown Orlando. You see that bus, rail, and highways all converge to sweep past the CBD. Then next to the CBD, we have our low class residential. Low class residential, they live next to our um, factories um, and that transportation corridor because they work in those factories and because they can't afford cars, then they need to be able to walk to their factory jobs or to use that transportation um, available. Then we have our medium, our middle class housing and our middle class housing for the first time is our largest segment of our population. And then extending from a, the corridor all the way out on the far end of the industry um, and transportation, uh, we have our high class residential. And keeping in mind the wealthiest people within every single wedge, uh, they live on the outside of that particular wedge. So as people gained in wealth, they would move further out to the outside of the wedge um, until they come to this high class residential all the way out here on the right side of the wedge. This is where the wealthiest people in this city live. Next is multiple nuclei model. Again, this is uh, based on Chicago as well. And this is an evolution of that sector model. And um, now we have not wedges, uh, not rings. We have that the city is organized in a series of nodes. So this is um, Almond and Harris, and this also explains the settlement patterns of people in cities and how they decide where to live. And that a city is a complex structure that includes more than one node around which activities, involve, uh, activities revolve. 
An example would be a port node, and around a port node, you would have particular um, activities and services. Um, let's say you would have those that service ships or store ships, um, perhaps people uh, or businesses that provide uh, parts for ships. Uh, maybe around a neighborhood business center, you would have other types of services um, that would be particular to that particular neighborhood uh, business center. Maybe it's a, a Kinko's or um, maybe you would have something like a pet store around a university node. Perhaps you would have those services that would be most attractive to university students like um, cheaper entertainment or bookstores. Um, or clothing stores that are much more trendy and cheaper. Maybe around an airport a node, you would have those that would be specific to the airport, like long-term parking, um, those that service planes, um, and you would see more hotels. And then around parks, even around high-class residential, you won't see the same services as what you would see around low-class residential. So around the city, you have a complex series of nodes, and around each of those nodes, you have particular um, services that will be specific to the node. So at the center of this model, again, just like the other models, you have the CBD. For the first time, we also see represented is um, that the cost of the land around the CBD is so much more expensive that the suburbanization of industry and business that you see that heavy industry is moving outside of the city into suburban um, outliers because that's where the land is much cheaper. So right next to this CBD, we have our light manufacturing. Then we have our low income housing here in three. Then in four, a larger segment of our population, again, is our middle class. Out here in five, we have our high class residential. Six over here is heavy manufacturing. Um, seven is our outlying business um, district. This could be that the people who live out here in the high class residential or a residential suburb, they may work in this particular outlying business center. They may have services there that are particular. Again, this is the suburbanization of not only people, but services. Um, and then uh, again, we have a residential suburb here and then our industrial suburb all the way over here. So a series of nodes. Some activities are attracted to particular nodes, whereas others try to avoid them. Again, you wouldn't see the same type of um, expensive restaurants around low-class residential as what you would around high-class residential. You wouldn't see the same sort of uh, services around a port as you would around an airport or the same sort of services around a university as you would around a high-class residential. And next on our models, let's talk about the peripheral model, the galactic model. This is probably the most relevant model in the world. I'm sorry, the most relevant model in the United States today. This is um, the, so this is um, Harris's model that explains settlement patterns of people in cities in the U.S. and how they decide where to live, especially given the location of different nodes and activities and edge cities. So again, you can see that this is similar to the multiple nuclei, but a further evolution of that, where you have your CBD here um, at the center. And then you're going to have your suburban residential areas. And around the suburban residential areas, you'll have those areas where um, you have your lower income sections and then middle income sections. And then further out um, and in different areas, you'll see um, higher income areas. Then um, out here in three, you'll have your uh, shopping mall, which is like Mall of Millennia would be. Think about this in terms of Orlando. So we have our Mall of Millennia out here. And then... Um, over here in four, we would have our industrial district, so where maybe you have some industrial parks for light manufacturing. Even sometimes you'll have your electrical um, and such out here as well. And then in five, we have our office park. Um, then uh, six is service center. Seven, we have our airport node all the way out here, just like we do in Orlando. And eight, we have our combined employment and shopping center. 
So man, this is more applicable applicable to many cities present presently. This consists of an inner city surrounded by large suburban residential and business areas tied together by transportation nodes, so main highways and freeways. Again, this would be like um, downtown Orlando, and then we have residential, we have shopping malls, and then our major roads connect like I-4 and 408 and 417. And that the, the city is a functional metropolitan complex, not a series of separate CBDs, and it represents urban decentralization.